Last time, uh, we talked about, uh, about transition state theory and general characteristics of rare events. Uh, we went through some examples of transition state theory, and I showed you how in practice you have to go out and find saddle uh, points and high dimensional potential energy surfaces. And then we talked about, um, is, is my microphone on, do you think? Uh, it's good? OK. Uh, OK, and we talked about variational transition state theory and transmission coefficients. And, uh, and this time, we're going we're gonna to sort of make a switch over to thinking about uh, this sort of Cromer's regime where you're diffusing over a barrier, and then you compute rates using mean first passage times. Very, very important in this limit because we don't have a, a correction for making an error in the rate constant in the reaction coordinates at the beginning. That we think about what reaction coordinates that we're using, uh, and uh, so I'll talk a little bit about coordinate validation today. Uh, we'll talk about transition path sampling. Uh, we'll talk about um, a new method, uh, kind of a, a twist on an old method, uh, inertial likelihood maximization, which sort of uh, extends the likelihood maximization framework that, that we've been using now for about six years. And uh, and then I will talk about uh, nucleation in a, in a Leonard Jones fluid as an example. And this afternoon we have tutorials. So let me, oh, I'm going to start the slideshow. OK, uh, let me start uh, by just recapping some of the, the key things. Uh, we talked about the necessity of this time scale separation to talk about using rare events methods and, uh, and properly defining rate constants. And we talked about transition state theory, which hinges upon uh, three assumptions. You have a dividing surface. You have an equilibrium, uh, equilibrium population of, transi of transition state species on that dividing surface relative to your reactive state. And you have uh, this no crossing property that once a trajectory crosses that dividing surface, it never comes back. And those three assumptions gave rise to an, a rate expression from transition state theory that looked like this. You have the, uh, the activation free energy to create an ensemble of transition states from the ensemble of reactants. You have a, uh, you have a, um, uh, absolute average velocity along your reaction coordinate at the barrier top and this factor half. Okay. So, uh, we talked a little bit about how you can practically compute these things using, uh, constrained averages and, uh, using free energy calculations. Okay. So, uh, we also went through harmonic transition state theory and said that when you have a problem where all the trajectories pass through uh, the region of a single saddle point on the, potential energy, on the potential energy surface, you can make a harmonic approximation to the potential energy in the vicinity of the saddle and use mass-weighted uh, coordinates and look at displacements from the saddle point along the unstable eigenvector uh, in these mass-weighted coordinates. And that gives you a good reaction coordinate that um, that gives you a rate constant with this expression. And uh, if you work in constant temperature and pressure instead of just constant temperature and, and, uh, and volume, then this converts into the I-ring uh, expression for transition state theory. Okay, so, so here is a point that I, I guess I didn't really make uh, yesterday that I, I think is very important. Um, you know, you, you typically see people doing this when they're studying bond breaking, bond making chemistry, okay? So why is this kind of approximation to the reaction coordinate and the dynamics, particularly that no crossing assumption, why is that a good approximation for bond breaking, bond making processes? Anybody want to venture a guess? High barrier. High barrier is part of it. Once you cross over, once you cross over the barrier and fall into the bottom of the well, there's a, a hopefully enough Enough changes in the in the you know if the landscape's perfectly harmonic, you might bounce back. It doesn't really happen, and uh, and you get quenched into the product state. So that's that's part of the reason. Yeah. Pretty distinct. You have a bond before. You don't have a bond after. So like there's pretty clear dividing surface. Good. Good. Uh, I'm going to rephrase what you've said just a little bit. The Atoms in a, in a bond, if they move about an angstrom or so, if that bond stretches about an angstrom or so, the bond is broken and a new bond is formed, right? Uh, so, so typically what happens is that, you know, if you only have to move an angstrom before the process is, for all practical purposes, over, you won't have any collisions at the top of the barrier, right? So there are two things that can cause recrossing. One is going to the bottom of the well and bouncing back out. That, that doesn't usually happen, but it does in 
sort of UHV conditions. Uh, but uh, um, the, the other process that can cause recrossing is collisions that happen before you make it off the top of the barrier, right? And there basically are no collisions in that one angstrom motion uh, distance, right? So thinking about these things is sort of a first, first pointer to decide, should I be using... Should I be using transition state theory or do I need Cromer's theory for this process, right? So you think about the, the sort of length scale and configuration space that you have to move and the density of obstacles in that space. And if, if you're going to collide with a bunch of other things before you make it off the top of the barrier, you should not be using harmonic transition state theory. So, so we typically use transition state theory for processes like this where you're breaking one bond and forming another one. And uh, on those sort of angstrom level displacement scales, this no recrossing assumption is, is pretty good. Uh, okay, so uh, we talked about algorithms for implementing this, uh, and and you know this is not a particularly practical algorithm, but it it uh, sort of launched a whole field. I think it's sort of sort of interesting. You know, if you've read any of Bill Miller's other papers, uh, they are uh, they're 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 difficult. Um, they are beautiful, uh, all semi classical theory uh, work. Um, but uh, but then he sort of sort of came down to earth and told all of us, okay, if you guys want to find transition states, here's how you do it. And he stopped working in this area and launched a whole field, right? So uh, so Bill Miller uh, made quite a quite a contribution to this area. And Nudge Elastic Band also set a lot of things in motion in the in these uh, kinds of string method algorithms that you'll hear about uh, next week. Uh, so that was uh, Hannes Jonsson. All right. So variational transition state theory. Uh, we um, we talked about how. Uh, this is sort of what's supposed to happen according to the assumptions of transition state theory. There are many other possibilities that can happen. And, uh, and we said that you know, all of these are overcounting uh, the flux through that barrier that's actually reactive. And so, so this, the variational transition state theory perspective says you should try to minimize these effects by finding a coordinate and a dividing surface along that coordinate that minimize the effect of recrossing. Right? So if you sort of move your dividing surface around in space, you can try and find a place that, that you, know, you don't see too many of these. Uh, maybe you only see these once in a while. Okay, So that's the, that's the uh, perspective that Wigner took on this way back in 1940. Since then, things have evolved a little bit. It's, uh, it's very, very difficult to do this coordinate optimization. And so what people uh, started to do back around 1980 uh, was instead to say, you know what, why don't we just use the coordinate that we have and come up with a way of correcting the TST rate constant for the effects of recrossing in that coordinate, right? So uh, this is the uh, transmission coefficient uh, showing this basically is a correlation, a time correlation function that tells you what are the effects of, of this transient recrossing behavior at the top of the barrier. And after some short time, all the trajectories have decided, are you going to the right or to the left? And this correlation function decays to a value uh, that gives you a correction to the transition state theory rate constant. So you take this kappa uh, value, you multiply it by KTST, and out comes the actual uh, rate constant for the process. OK, so it was mentioned to me after the lecture the other day that I have said nothing about tunneling. Um, that is true. I have to leave some things out. Tunneling is very important if you have hydrogen transfer processes, proton transfer processes. Even at room temperature, you can get very substantial tunneling uh, corrections for protons moving around. Uh, so. So you want to be aware that those things exist. And uh, unfortunately, we're not going to spend much time talking about them other than those sentences right there. Uh, OK. All right, so then we talked a little bit about um, this example, the hydrate guest uh, molecule diffusion, where we look at the rate at which methane can hop between donor cages and acceptor cages in the hydrate structure. So it looks, you know, this is sort of a transition state along one of these hops. Uh, we went through. Uh, and said a little bit about how you choose coordinates, um, and uh, talked about some of the some of the the things that you can tell when umbrella sampling is is being done with the wrong coordinate if your windows start to not match up. Uh, so uh, so that was a sort of example. You know, I, I showed you that that when we use the wrong coordinate, that happened, and we had to go to these spherical bipolars, and everything everything works out quite well. In fact, you can see this coordinate. Uh, sort of perfectly meshes with the shape of the underlying free energy surface, which is, which is uh, the way we like for everything to come out. Uh, okay, so uh, so then after that, after doing the transition state theory calculation, which requires this free energy calculation, uh, we can do the transmission coefficient calculation. There are a couple of points here that I didn't really mention. Uh, this coordinate, because we numerically optimize 
using ghost atoms, the positions of vacancies, right? So usually in your biomolecular simulations, you're saying, I'm going to sample along this dihedral angle. And there are four atoms with specific positions that define that dihedral angle at every point in time, right? Many problems, the ideal coordinate that you want to use has no easy way to, uh, to compute it. Uh, for example, this one, I want to know where the donor cage is and the acceptor cage is. But by virtue of the fact that these are vacant, there's nothing there, right? So we have to come up with some ghost atom that, that detects where the, these things are by being optimized on the fly during the, during the molecular dynamics simulations. And so this ghost atom is always sort of trying to find the, the place where nothing is so it can sit there. It doesn't affect where the other guys are going. It just, just goes and sits there. The point of this, all of this uh, discussion, is that this is a, a numerical optimization to find the position of this and the position of this. And they are involved in the definition of this reaction coordinate. So it's hopeless to imagine that I'm going to compute derivatives of this reaction coordinate. Uh, and that means that things like umbrella sampling, metadynamics, steered MD, they're all, they're all out, right? All of those things require that you have derivatives of your reaction coordinate so that you can compute forces on that reaction coordinate. Uh, and, and so for problems like this, and, and we find that many times if you, if you take the time to try and optimize what, what coordinate you should be using, it doesn't fit into this framework, and we quite often need to switch and go to using things like hybrid molecular uh, dynamics, Monte Carlo uh, kinds of methods where you, you compute a little trajectory and then you accept or reject the outcome of that trajectory. Uh, these, are, uh, these are very, very versatile methods. There's an alternative way of doing this called uh, BOLAS, which was invented by Ravi Radhakrishnan and, and uh, Tamar Schlick. Uh, and uh, you know, we've, we've done some work on this as well. Basically, BOLAS is equilibrium path sampling. So you've probably heard a lot about transition path sampling. But you can also use path sampling ideas uh, to compute the probability that a system visits a certain region, which is the free energy, related to the free energy by the logarithm. And, uh, and this is equally applicable uh, to these kinds of free energy sampling problems. Um, so um, so I, I won't say much more about these, but, you know, as we go through the talk, I think you'll you'll see that that in many cases, when we optimize reaction coordinates carefully, we find coordinates for which these methods are not applicable. And uh, and of course, my view is that we should always try and use the optimal coordinate and let the let the physics of the underlying problem choose what methods we use. So we quite often are doing free energy calculations using these using these tools. Uh, rather than using these things which sort of prescribe for us what kinds of coordinates we will have to use. Uh, okay, so the other thing uh, that we talked about was how once you've computed all the rates for these elementary hops, you plug them into kinetic Monte Carlo and you look at the mean squared displacement as a function of time and you can extract the diffusivity. Okay, so I didn't really tell you how kinetic Monte Carlo works and that's where we're going to start with new stuff today. Okay, everybody, everybody with me so far? That was a that was like a 12 minute recap with a little bit of extra stuff. Uh, okay. All right. So here's the basic idea between uh, behind, uh, behind kinetic Monte Carlo. So kinetic Monte Carlo describes the dynamics of a so-called Markov state model. And uh, I want to try and make this example uh, explicit. Uh, here is a sketch of a problem that are you know reams of papers written on. Uh, proton transport through single file water chains going through pores, right? So you have some, some little nanopore, waters line up in the pores, and if there's a pH gradient uh, or a electric, electrical uh, a potential gradient, the, the proton will try to jump from one water molecule to the next along this chain and gradually make it across, across this thing. And you can, you can think about the proton likes to be out here because it's well solvated, doesn't like to be in here because it's not solvated as well anymore, and then it and then it likes to be over here again where it can be solvated again. So there's a there's a barrier, effectively a square top kind of barrier, uh, for moving across the the channel here, and and people describe these kinds of things using molecular dynamics, but you could imagine describing this thing by saying, you know, if I know there are only say four waters in this in this channel, then there are only four places for the proton to sit in the chain. And so instead of looking at trajectories that have a continuous location of the, maybe you have a center of the uh, excess charge uh, and you, you follow where that is along this axis, you could imagine plotting an MD trajectory 
uh, with this continuous coordinate versus time, and it would rattle around in the location where one water sits, and then it would quickly jump across to the next water and rattle around in here, and then jump again. Maybe it takes a couple steps backwards along the way, and eventually makes it to the other side. Right? So that's what you would see in MD. Uh, you can instead discretize this, right? You can say, you know, the system sits here for a while and then jumps. So why don't I just call this a state, call this a state, call this a state, and that, that one and that one, right? So now you've got one, two, three, four states in this problem, and you can write down the probability uh, as a function of time for being in every one of those states using a master equation that Giovanni Busi showed in the very, very first lecture on uh, Sunday night. Okay, so now the, now the problem changes, right? We're no longer interested in simulating the trajectories. Uh, we're interested in just finding the state-to-state -state hopping rates, right? So you jump from this water to that water with some characteristic rate constant, k, right? And you can imagine that maybe if there's a potential, the forward rates are different from the backward rates, right? So there's a driving force pushing this thing across. And, and now you have a, a simplified model of this thing where your trajectories just look like this. They're, they're sitting on, on water number one, then they jump to number two, then to number three, and then maybe back down to two, and etc. So your MD trajectory in this master equation framework becomes a sequence of dwell times and transition events, right? So dwell times, how long did you sit on this water before you jump? We expect that to be about one over K, right? Uh, and, then, and then, you know, all of the details are just in how long you sat there and where you jumped next. Right, so so that's a the basic idea behind kinetic Monte Carlo is that once you found the state-to-state -state hopping rates, you can take the cost of simulating all of this boring dynamics in here and just simulate these, and you're basically getting the same thing, right? All right, so how does it work in practice? Um, so uh, so you know for some master equations like the one I just showed, you can exactly solve them. You don't you don't need any numerical methods. Uh, you can just find uh, the probability of being in J as a function of T uh, given in the initial condition. Uh, but in many cases, we have very, very complicated uh, master equations that are not even given in terms of a matrix. They're given in terms of a set of rules for where you can hop next and what rate that will have. And uh, so for those kinds of problems, we have this thing that we call the Gillespie algorithm, which ironically came out first by Collins, Leibowitz, and, and Bortz. Uh, a year earlier than Gillespie. That happens sometimes. Hope, may it never happen to you. Uh, so, uh, so anyhow, um, both made uh, important contributions here. And, uh, and so basically the Gillespie algorithm does the following thing. It says you're sitting in state I right now. Uh, what are all the actions that can happen from state I? That is, where can I jump next? And you say, when does the next reaction occur? Right? And you also ask, uh, of all the reactions that can occur, given that it happens at this time, what reaction will it be, right? And that's the, the two things that the Gillespie algorithm does. It is sort of disarmingly simple. Uh, this is a bit of a problem. I, I uh, took a screen capture from my, from my, uh, from a book chapter um, in, in progress here. Uh, and uh, you can see my spell check on. Anyway, who cares? Uh, all right, so, so the first step in the algorithm is that you say, if I'm currently sitting in step i, then what are all the rates of hops that can happen from this state to other states, right? So we don't need to consider the current coming towards us from other states because we know we're in state i. We're given that we're sitting here right now, okay? So we compute all the rates leaving state i, and we add them up, right? Why do we add them? Because if you think about how long, what is the probability that reaction i to j will happen, that if, if I wait some time t, the probability that it has not happened yet is e to the minus k i to j times t, right? If I want to require that none of them have happened by that time, they're all independently, the clock is ticking independently for all of them, right? So you multiply that, that whole chain of exponentials together, and the product of exponentials is the exponential of the sum of the arguments. And so we end up with an effective rate constant for leaving state i, that is the sum of all the rate constants out of that state. Okay, that really probably isn't so surprising at the end of the day. Uh, then you sample two random numbers from the uniform distribution. You compute uh, the time. Uh, so, so given that this came from an exponential distribution, you can expect that you're going to have to map your uniformly distributed random number onto an exponential distribution. We do that by uh, inverting this through the logarithm. 
get the time at which, uh, at which it will decay to reach that value of the random number. And, uh, and then you set j to be the smallest integer uh, from all of the different possibilities. So basically, if, if I have uh, i going to state, uh, to state um, uh, let's call it j1, i going to some other state, j2, and the rate for this one is very, very big, right? And then i can go to another one that's really small. Uh, I can go to yet another state that's even smaller. And then maybe there's one out here that has also a fast rate. So, so basically what we're doing now is we're saying, imagine this as the uniform distribution from 0 to 1. Throw a dart at this line. And if it lands, I'll close my eyes. OK, it lands here. And this was a very big rate. So it's likely that the next reaction will take me to J2. Okay, so it's kinetic Monte Carlo. So kinetic Monte Carlo, uh, you know, you probably hear quite often people say Monte Carlo can't tell you about dynamics. It can in this in this representation, right? So this is this is using the rate constants uh, with the assumption that you have a Markov process uh, uh, for the state-to-state -state hopping probabilities, and then you can actually generate the the state-to-state -state transition dynamics in in a system. So this is a very very powerful algorithm, and uh, and you know, in 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 my view, it's so simple that everybody should at least know that it exists. And if you run into one of these problems, you can uh, you can solve it with this with this framework. All right. Uh, so um, so I want to kind of uh, walk through a little demo on the chalkboard. So so these actually are are my kids on the chalkboard. This is Lyndon and Avon, and uh, they are drawing uh, pictures on their on their little easel at home. Uh, I have no idea why they're in these green suits, um, but uh, <laughs> that that must be something that my wife did. Uh, this this is my wife's name, Ban, and Lyndon. While I was gone, I, I I missed things. I've been away from home for a very long time, and uh, and Lyndon wrote. This is his first word was his mom's name, which uh, undoubtedly is with some encouragement from her. Uh, but um, but anyway, it's a uh, proud papa. Okay. So, um, uh, okay, so, uh, so let's imagine that we go back to the hydrates example. And we have a, a giant block of hydrate that we could never, ever afford to simulate with molecular dynamics, right? Say we've got maybe uh, a 1,000 unit cells here of the hydrate structure. Okay, and we'll just draw the lattice like this. I won't go into the detail of all of the things. So there's supposed to be a methane at every one of these, every one of these points, right? But methanes can move around when they're adjacent to a vacancy, right? So we'll draw vacancies like this, okay? So let's suppose that there are two vacancies in this system, okay? So now the the whole system is occupied. I have methanes everywhere except for at these two points, okay? And this is the state of the system. So when we say that the system is in state, is in state J, uh, J involves a lot of information. You know where every atom is right now. Okay. So what are the different moves that can happen now? I've got, I've got a vacancy here, and it, this guy can't move there, uh, but this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy. So I've got here is reaction one. Here is, so this is, this is J uh, going to some state I1, and here's uh, J going to some state I2. Here's J uh, going to some state I3, right? So, so uh, this is basic. So why are these different states? Because after the hop happens, the vacancy will be in a different place. So we can't distinguish the methanes themselves. But the, the vacancy will have moved here if if this methane moves into that spot, right? So these are these are all different pathways, and in principle, they all have different rates because their local environments affect the kinetics. Okay. So so basically, what we're and we're going to have to account for all of the different rates of these methanes hopping into this site, right? So the the state J can decay in this case by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different pathways. Right, and one of the key challenges in kinetic Monte Carlo, uh, if you're on a lattice, we usually have a very systematic way of counting 
the different number of pathways that, that we have because they're specified by little simple rules like this. Uh, if you're off lattice in Kinetic Monte Carlo, and, and uh, there's important work going on there, particularly in the realm of uh, amorphous solids, um, then we have to adaptively go out and find the different, uh, and find the different uh, transitions that can happen from every state, right? So then we're really, really relying on these search algorithms like Serge Ann Miller and, and uh, Dimer method and eigenvector following to really tell us everything that's out there. It's a, it's a very, um, very delicate uh, uh, business because you're never 100% sure that you've got all of them. However, uh, so uh, Norman Mousseau uh, has a, a pretty powerful framework uh, for, uh, so this is, I'll give you guys this name and this reference. It's N. Mousseau, okay? And he has developed these methods that are all called ART, uh, so activation relaxation technique, which is a completely contrived name. So he names them kinetic art, art nouveau, uh, and, and et cetera, right? So uh, they're, they're, uh, so activation relaxation technique is basically his, his way of going out and building catalogs of the different uh, transitions that he's seen before so that he doesn't have to run those transition state searches again. And uh, it's a pretty powerful framework, right? So, so this thing, I think, if you're going to go into the world of using Kinetic Monte Carlo, uh, particularly looking at solids is a, uh, a nice thing to know that it's out there. Uh, okay, so um, so is that enough on Kinetic Monte Carlo? I think is everybody everybody satisfied that they at least know how it works? You guys are you guys are going to have to start it. Okay, great. Yeah. Could you also compute like the the potential energy of that move, or is it just purely kinetic? You, okay, so the forward and backward rates have to satisfy a detailed balance relation, right? So that's something that you know for the master in the master equation is built in. Uh, but you know when you're when you're doing it with a computational framework, you want to make sure that the way you estimate the forward rates and the way you estimate the backward rates is consistent with that detailed balance criteria, right? So um, so uh, I, I should also note that the effect of not finding if you're off lattice. And you don't, and you say you're off lattice and you look for transition states, but you only find one of them, then the effect of this is that your, your kinetic Monte Carlo calculation first takes different pathways than it would if you found them all. This one might not be the fastest one. And also, even if it happens to go the same way, it will take a much longer time to do it because the increment of time depends in kinetic Monte Carlo on knowing the sum. Of all of the, so if you have a if you have a sum that's too small because you left out some of these processes, the increment of time becomes too big, right? And so you can, and there are examples of this in the literature. One in particular, Norman Mousseau uh, pointed out that somebody got this wrong by like a factor of, of like ten to the six or something, right? So you can really really bungle things by by not having a reliable way of finding all of these transitions, and that's a that's a that's an area where where we're uh, starting to think about working uh, for things in uh, in uh, cladding materials for nuclear reactors. So um, so anyway, it's uh, th it has many more applications than that though, and it's a uh, kinetic Monte Carlo is an incredibly useful thing. It finds its way into biophysics, uh, which is where Gillespie was working, and in uh, sort of solid state physics, which was where uh, where Bortz and Carlos were working. Uh, okay, so let's um, let's go and. Uh, continue continue on. So, so that was a little bit of an excursion. We were in Kinetic Monte Carlo, we were using rate constants uh, to simulate processes that involve many, many transitions. Yeah? So from this I can get a physical sense of how this can be used for say reactions. Yeah. Uh, how can this be used for say reactions? I mean, there are no vacancies in the reactions. There are no, I mean, how do you define different reactants and products in the same grid or yeah, I, you know, I'm not, I'm no expert on biochemical switches, uh, but it's one of the common examples where people use kinetic Monte Carlo because in a in a pro, in a cell, uh, the proteins that, that uh, activate uh, DNA for reading. I'm probably saying all this stuff wrong. Uh, so the, the proteins that activate some strand of DNA for reading may be present only in a couple of copy numbers. So if you solve the differential equations using a well-stirred well model of the cell, uh, fluctuations from two, if that's the typical copy number of that protein, 
if there's one, things are a lot different. And if there's four, things are a lot different, right? So the average is two is meaningful if you mean two moles, right? And then the fluctuations around two moles is small. Uh, but fluctuations around the actual number two uh, it can be pretty important, right? So people think about this uh, specifically in these examples where you have... Uh, so this is going to give you an idea of uh, some, some reactions that can happen, right? So you have, a, so you have some uh, species A uh, that, that uh, comes in and it, it binds uh, to some active site on DNA. And if A is bound, this can't be red, uh, but maybe, there's a, maybe this, uh, this DNA strand, when it is red, makes B, and then B comes back around and binds A so that A is out of the picture, right? And you get these bistable networks that uh, really, in order to describe them, you absolutely have to have the fluctuations and the concentrations, these small copy numbers uh, present. So, uh, so these, are, these are examples from systems biology. Uh, where people study these kinds of things, and uh, and I'm I'm not an expert on them. so um, so for reactions uh, in catalysis, people use them uh, when they when they think about, uh, for example, Charlie Campbell um, gets a uh, Charlie Campbell is a guy at, at uh, University of Washington, and he thinks about if you've got a whole sequence of of steps uh, for a catalytic reaction. Um, uh, sort of similarly, you know, if I change the rate constant for one of them a little bit, uh, what does the overall rate of conversion do? How does it respond uh, to that change? And you can run kinetic Monte Carlo, uh, and you know, when you're, when you're uh, dealing with a situation where knowing that the sites are half back, half occupied by this, you really need to know zero or one. Uh, there are there are examples like that where the steady state gets things wrong, and the steady state from a well stirred model gets things wrong, but these kinetic Monte Carlo approaches will which account for fluctuations properly, uh, will get things right. Okay, does that kind of give you an idea? Okay. Uh, all right, so, so what we're going to do now is uh, go back to thinking not about using rate constants for, doing, uh, for studying processes that involve many, many reactions, but now go back to thinking about how do we actually compute the rate constants themselves. Okay, and we're going to start leaving the realm of transition state theory here uh, going towards things that resemble more uh, Cromer's theory. Okay, so Cromer's wrote this famous paper in 1940, uh, where where he, you know, this is me paraphrasing him, uh, but uh, but basically he describes uh, a reaction not in terms of an equilibrium between state A and a state B, but has a, a rather more general way of thinking about it. That every time, so I'm going to imagine I have a population of A sitting in in this well, and every time it escapes. However that happens, I'm going to pick it up and put it back in. Okay, so I call this rescue and replace, right? So, so this thing escapes, and he picks it up and puts it back in. And if you do this over and over again, what happens is that you set up a steady state current uh, of trajectories leaving the barrier, right? So notice that we now do not have equilibrium at the top of the barrier. It's close to equilibrium. The deviations are not usually very big, uh, but you do have some deviations from equilibrium. And uh, so the sort of celebrated result in Cromer's theory uh, was the prediction that there was a turnover, right? So you can think about, uh, I've, I've shown here what looks like diffusion over the top of the barrier, which would correspond to having a very high friction coefficient, right? So, so remember in, uh, in uh, general, we have that the diffusivity is related to the friction uh, by, uh, by this gamma. So if we make the, the friction go uh, very, very high. Uh, the, the rate at which we can move along this, this, uh, this uh, coordinate Q is going to become very, very, very small. before. So it'll basically collide with something all the time. And, uh, and this goes back to this argument that I gave you at the beginning, that if you think about how long you will move before you bump into something and, and have your direction reversed, uh, in transition state theory, you move all the way across. In uh, at least one regime of Cromer's theory, you basically move nowhere, and that gives rise to this diffusion over the barrier, right? Uh, so, so one of the results of Cromer's theory that I think is um, is sort of uh, the key uh, famous thing is called his turnover. And if we plot the actual rate over the TST rate, so this is a, a barrier with dynamics given by Langevin dynamics that Giovanni showed you at the very beginning of the uh, workshop. 
um, you get a you get a, a peak, right? So technically, Cromers didn't do this part, but he, he got this part and this part, and it was enough to see that there's a peak here. And, and so what's happening over here is what you pointed out, Heather, uh, and that's that trajectories are um, trajectories are going across the barrier, coming back around, and bouncing back out. Right. So this is recrossing because of very low friction. You remember your your direct. You remember your kinetic energy all the way through the bottom of the well. You do an orbit, and we call these things orbits. Uh, so you orbit the well at constant energy, right? So your potential energy went down, but your kinetic energy went up. So this thing orbits the well and comes right back across. And it does this over and over and over again. Uh, so, so in Okay? And at high gamma, we have uh, the Cromer's regime, which is diffusion over the barrier. Okay? So he predicted forms for the, the asymptotic. Uh, uh, so notice here, this is kappa, right? This ratio is kappa. So there's a there's a range in uh, you know we're getting sort of intermediate values where transition state theory is almost correct. Okay? And as you make the friction really, really small, transition state theory becomes very bad. And actually this theory is kind of bad too. Uh, there's a th th this is sort of going the right direction, but not at the right way. Uh, so there's a theory called RKM. Theory, Ramsberger, Rice, Castles, Marcus, uh, uh, that describes this region very well. Okay, and over here uh, we have a mean first passage time. Okay, MFPT, mean first passage time, uh, that uh, describes that really high friction regime very well. And in the middle, transition state theory is approximately correct. Okay? Not quite correct, according to Cromer's, but, uh, but uh, approximately correct. Okay, so, um, so, that's, uh, so this is, uh, I think, um, you know, one of the most uh, important papers in, in the field because it really takes all of these processes, you know, this is sort of what you expect if you have small molecules undergoing reaction in a, in a uh, UHV conditions uh, where collisions are very, very rare. Uh, and over here is what you expect if you have an activated process that's like a protein folding problem uh, or a uh, nucleation problem. And uh, this is what you expect if you have things like chemical bonds breaking and making, right? So the remarkable thing about this paper is that he has one framework that describes all things and gets, gets them decently well, right? I mean, qualitatively well, right? So it has people pick on this theory a lot, which I think is, is really missing the point, right? I mean, the fact that it does, does qualitatively the right thing over here, quantitatively the right thing over here, and, and gets this also is, is really, really remarkable, right? So, um, so, uh, so this is another, so I said I love transition state theory, and I also love this one, okay? I guess you guys can tell from my enthusiasm that I like this, okay? The y-axis is kappa. The y-axis is the prediction for the transmission coefficient, which is the correction to the correction to there. I just I just uh, crowded it with all these other things. Okay. okay, so it's the ratio of the real rate to the transition state theory rate, right? Okay, so uh, there are a couple of practical limitations uh, that should be mem mentioned. Uh, so, so we have. This expression right here, this is that KMFPT, right? The mean first passage time. This is what the rate constant becomes as gamma gets very large and as the diffusion constant for moving along this reaction coordinate gets very low, right? So those two things hand in hand with each other. Uh, okay, so this is the, uh, this is that mean first passage time expression. A couple things to note here. The, uh, this is, this little notation, the, the little, uh, thing stands for near the top of the barrier. This only contributes near the top of the barrier because it's e to the plus beta f. So if free energy gets high, this is exponentially magnified getting high. 
and we don't need to worry about what happens at the bottom of the barrier with this guy. Uh, this is the dynamical prefactor, effectively, is the mobility at the top of the barrier. And remember in transition state theory, we had the velocity at the top of the barrier. Here we have the diffusion coefficient at the top of the barrier, right? And over here, you have e to the minus beta f of q. So this is the, uh, and this is integrated over the region near the bottom of the well, right? Which is the only place where it contributes, right? So this guy, uh, this guy now looks like the uh, free energy of all of the, um, of the reactants. And this is the free energy of the transition states. If you look at it, it's plus, minus, so it's the activation free energy, effectively, in this expression. And this thing is going to give you your units of inverse time uh, that will, will lead to this thing having uh, the proper units. Okay, so, uh, so the problem in this expression is that if you plug in different, so if you really think about this as a representation of a many-dimensional problem where you could have chosen many different expressions for Q, if you, if you choose a different Q, you get a different F. And you also get a different D, okay? And it's not like the case in the inertial barrier crossings where we can compute the kappa and it'll all correct itself, right? Uh, in this case, if you choose the wrong reaction coordinate, you just get a wrong number and there's nothing you can do to recover from it. It's a, it's irreversible spiral down the toilet. All of your work is, is worthless, okay? So, uh, so, so it's very important when we're using these kinds of frameworks that we really think carefully about what reaction coordinate to use, what, what Q that is, in, uh, in this expression. Okay? Uh, so another thing I want to point out is that in this, uh, we, we call this the overdamped limit. Uh, velocity has completely vanished from the problem here, and you now have just a diffusion constant. Uh, if it's a true diffusion, then velocity is not even properly defined, right? And so there's no, no velocity in the problem. Therefore, there is no TST rate and it, it's not possible to compute a kappa for this problem, right? So you see people sometimes will, will take a trajectory and they'll finite difference, a, a diffusion, random walk kind of process, uh, and try to use that to compute a kappa. But the problem with that is that for a true random walk, at all, no matter how small you make your finite difference, the velocity keeps changing, right? Uh, so you maybe have to go home and think about that one a little bit. Uh, but there's, there's no time scale on which you can relate uh, the, the distance between points on that trajectory to the velocity. And so, so we can only get rates by thinking about steady currents. And I think, I think Eric Van Eenden will talk about uh, currents a lot in, uh, in past theory lectures. But the same idea is, is here, basically, right? You have, you have a current because velocity has vanished from the problem, and uh, that makes these kinds of frameworks um, inapplicable. Okay, so, uh, so you know, I, I mentioned that there's this, there's this uh, problem that you have to know what reaction coordinate to put into the expression, right? And uh, this was partially resolved in 1969. Uh, James Langer, who is now at UCSB, uh, it's a great place for, for people to do graduate work if you, if you uh, like this stuff. So Jim Langer uh, wrote this landmark paper back in 1969 where he said, let's imagine that we uh, didn't want to reduce the Cromer's problem down to 1D, but instead think about there being many coordinates that are important in the problem. Right? So you can imagine now finding the saddle point on the free energy landscape, which as Michaela told you is smooth. right? So you find a saddle point on the free energy landscape. Here's a little free energy landscape with a rainbow color map, uh, which I was told this morning is a bad thing to do. Uh, OK, so I've got this saddle point, and I'm going to uh, make a, a second, uh, make a harmonic approximation in the space of these two collective variables. Don't worry about what they are. Uh, the point is we can describe there's an unstable mode in this direction, going from stable over a barrier to stable, and then there's a, a stable mode going from high to low back to high uh, free energy in this direction. Okay, so we can make a harmonic approximation in the vicinity of this saddle. And that's what this free energy does. So it's a function of where you move along the different collective variables. Now we have several of them. And this matrix A is that second derivative matrix, right? So it's the Hessian that we had in our original thing. But now it's in the free energy landscape and not the energy landscape. OK, so Jim Langer proved uh, in a you know, paper that, that you can find summarized in many textbooks, which is a little easier to read than his paper. Uh, so uh, he proved that the, the rate uh, the the rate of passage over this barrier in the multidimensional system, 
sort of the multidimensional generalization of Cromer's theory is this expression, right? So you see the, the activation free energy, you see an eigenvalue sitting here, uh, and this, this uh, what corresponds to the frequencies in the vineyard formula, but now they are just determinants of matrices on the free energy uh, surface. Uh, so what is this eigenvalue, this lambda plus, that's sitting here in the rate constant expression? It is the one negative eigenvalue of the matrix DA, okay? D is the diffusion tensor, okay? So the free energy is not the whole story. We need to know something about how fast you can move in different directions on this surface to uh, compute, a, compute a rate constant, okay? So the D is a diffusion tensor. It, its elements are, uh, it's a covariance matrix, effectively. Uh, so say I have uh, Q, I have a trajectory Q at time T, and suppose I prepare a whole bunch of these trajectories uh, all at the same initial condition. I'm going to take Q of T minus the average value of Q of T. I square that, and I compute its average, right? So this is now a swarm of trajectories launched from one point, and they, they diffuse, influenced by the potential energy surface. So this might be drifting, right, which is why we subtract it away. So they feel the potential, they feel the, the potential amine, the, the force from the potential amine force, and they drift, and the mean of the swarm moves, and as they drift, they also spread out, right, because they're diffusing on the, on the free energy surface, okay? So this is telling you for the individual trajectories, how far did they spread around what the mean of them were doing? When you square that and average it, you get diffusion along the Q coordinate, right? We can also mix coordinates together. So we could look at QI minus QI multiplied by QJ, QJ average. Okay, so in all cases, we're doing this thing. And that is the off-diagonal element of this diffusion tensor. Okay, so if you're in one dimension, this is the only thing you have. This is the Cromer's D, right? If you're working on a multidimensional landscape, oh, I, I've really, really done a, done a terrible thing here. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Uh, there's a 2 and a T. Uh, okay. so, uh, so we also, um, you know, I have to, in principle, take the, um, uh, the, the vector of Q uh, Uh, I guess that's an outer, outer product, dynamic product, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so these now are vectors. Okay? And this is a matrix like this. Okay? So that defines this matrix uh, D. Okay? And, uh, and you can see an example um, in uh, you get a lot of theoretical work on this, but um, one, of the, one of the first examples... Uh, using this is actually from a paper of ours in 2009 where, where we addressed this uh, polymorph selection problem uh, for, um, for uh, creation from metastable state where we have two possible products. Okay, so, um, so, so the point of this equation is that you have both influences of the free energy landscape and of the relative mobilities on that free energy landscape. Define, uh, define this, uh, this lambda and the eigenvector corresponding to the lambda is the flux, right? It's the direction that trajectories take. As they escape through this saddle point, which direction do they go? If you want to know the answer to that question, you construct this, this matrix, and you diagonalize it, look for the negative eigenvalue, and this is the way trajectories go. So if you're watching movies of your process, this is what you should do, right? And, uh, and so there's, you know, really nice connection between the theory and things that you can do in, in systems here. And uh, I think this, uh, this idea is, uh, is really, you know, for a long time, I think nobody, this was sort of forgotten and, and, uh, and buried in the physics literature, probably not forgotten by physics, uh, but, but chemists, I think, had really forgotten about this result. And, um, and uh, moving, to, moving to UCSB, I was, I was quickly reminded of it because, because this guy is here. Uh, okay, so, um, uh, so you have... Uh, now, another paper that came out that I think is, uh, it, it took some, some uh, I don't know, my edition is not very good, 36 years, I guess, uh, for, for 
somebody to notice this, but Bereskovsky and Zabo wrote this beautiful little paper in J. Kim in 2005. And they asked, what if we take the theory of Jim Langer for the many-dimensional system, and we suppose that within the many-dimensional system that he has, we just randomly pick the direction, right, and use that as our reaction coordinate. Okay? So if you project both the free energy, which is basically this matrix A, and uh, at least that's the shape of the free energy surface at the saddle point. Uh, so you're going to project that onto, uh, onto this direction E, right? So let me, let me draw some pictures, make sure everybody's, everybody's with me here. Too many things in my hands. All right, so here is the, the free energy surface. Here is the transition state location. We've got this sort of matrix that characterizes the shape of it in the vicinity of the saddle point, and, uh, and also a matrix D that characterizes the shape of this surface, in the, or sorry, the, the mobility in the vicinity of this saddle point. And so this is in terms of Q1, and Q2, and perhaps many other Qs, okay? If you want to use your imagination there. Okay, so now what what, uh, what Beresfoss and Zabo did was they said, if we instead just used uh, this direction E and called displacement from the saddle along E my new reaction coordinate, right? Okay, so, so what happens then is that you get a diffusivity that is uh, E, D, uh, like this. This is the, the diffusivity in the one-dimensional system. Well, you get a corresponding uh, free energy uh, matrix that characterizes the curvature. Same, same kind of construction with the quadratic form. And, and so what, uh, what ends up happening is that you get, a, you get an expression for the rate. So now you take those, those results. You've got the mobility in one dimension and the free energy surface near the saddle in one dimension. You plug those back into the one-dimensional Cromer's theory, and this is the rate expression that you get. And this is not the same as that. Okay? So that's sort of consistent with what I alluded to at the beginning, that you have to know what direction to pick to get the right answer. The fact that if we just pick a random direction, that is pick a random reaction coordinate, uh, or even one that we like, um, and, and go about computing with it, we might be computing stuff that doesn't correspond to the real kinetics of the process. Okay, so, so this, is, uh, this is this argument quantified, and it, it shows that, you know, in general, if you just pick randomly, you won't get the right, the right results. However, they found that, you know, this number is always bigger than this number, right? This rate is always faster than this rate. And that suggests that we should try and make this as, as good as possible by minimizing uh, over all possible choices of that direction, right? Same argument as in variational transition state theory, but now for diffusion over a barrier. So here's what they did. What, what they did, they, they took this expression and they did a variational optimization uh, over the, the vector E. Uh, and what they found was that there was a direction, E plus, defined by AD, the eigenvector of AD, right? Notice that, that Langer's direction was dA, right? And now, so this was for the multidimensional problem, and what Langer found was the direction of the flux. What these guys found was E plus, and it's the eigen, eigenvector of AD. It has the exact same eigenvalue as this one, because these are real symmetric matrices. That should happen. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, now going to tell you uh, that if you... So the, the really important part of this is that when you use this special direction, this result becomes exactly the same as this result. Okay? So I, I hope I haven't lost too many people here, but, but the point is a very important one. It's that if you solve the multidimensional problem where you have all of the collective variables, the ideal thing to do, right? You get an answer that's correct in principle. If you pick one direction, in general, it's wrong. But if you pick the special direction E+, plus, uh, then it becomes exact again, right? So it's always possible to reduce the multidimensional problem onto one, right? And this is uh, 
this is the uh, the thing that uh, Bereskovsky and Zabo showed that I think is so wonderful, right? Uh, so what is that direction? Well, they proved in their paper that it is the committer probability, right? So you've probably heard about how many people have heard about the committer committer before. Cam, I know Cam has heard about that. You work with Eric Van Eenden, you hear about the committer every sentence. Uh, okay, so um, so this this uh, shows that the you know if you take the multidimensional coordinate and you compute the probability of going to state B, it's exactly uh, so the gradient of this this committer probability, this PB, is the direction E plus, right? Uh, so so again, you can always reduce the multidimensional problem onto an equivalent one-dimensional problem if you choose the direction for your reduction as the committer probability, right? Which I think is a, a very uh, important thing to remember. Uh, we have uh, people even before 2005 were working in this direction. Uh, let, me, let me pause for a moment and talk about what is the committer. Uh, it is uh, in this picture you can see uh, that every configuration, not in state A and not in state B, has a, uh, so if I take an all atom description of my system, I launch a bunch of trajectories, and I count what fraction of those trajectories go to state B, uh, and what fraction go to A. The fraction that go to state B, uh, in this little drawing, it's three-fourths, uh, is the committer probability, right? So the committer probability, if I start in A, all the trajectories immediately are in A, and the committer probability in here is here, right? If I am on the edge of A, it's probably the case that all of these trajectories will also go back to, to A, right? So at the edge of A, we have PB equals 0. And as we move along the reaction pathway through the saddle point here, we would expect that this is going to go through PB equals 1 half. When we move on over here, it eventually reaches PB equals 1. If I launch trajectories from here, a couple of them might do this, but they just go back and forth back in, in state B. Okay, so the committer probability goes to 1 when I'm in state B. It goes to 0 when I'm in state A. And if I find a configuration for which the committer probability is equal to 1 half, then that's a transition state. Okay, so this committer probability, uh, in, at least for these overdamped uh, problems, is the reaction coordinate. If we, if we could do an ideal reduction from the multidimensional problem down to one dimension, uh, then this is the one that we would want, right? Well, okay, yeah? If you have more than two states, then you have a, you have a committer vector, um, which is not something that people, people are still struggling with trying to get these right, right? And I think people have sort of thought that, you know, that you can have a, uh, committer for reaching this state and that state and that state, uh, but I don't think there's been much work on those kinds of problems yet. If there's been any, it's probably Peter Ballhouse's work, uh, where he looks at uh, transition interface sampling uh, with multiple states and multiple channels, and uh, it, you you can check check those kinds of things if you if you're interested. Good question, tough question. So, is this like a more like a trial and error method on like? We will get to that. We will get to that. Very soon, we will get to that. Uh, okay, so uh, again, to summarize, KLBS theory tells us that the flux direction, let me show you this picture. This is the direction that Jim Langer found. And when you take the transpose, of the, or we take the, the com, uh, commuted, uh, commuted matrices, uh, matrices A and D uh, versus D and A, the eigenvalue is the same, but the eigenvector is different. Okay, so the flux direction and the reaction direction are different, right? What does that mean? So, so LBS tells us unless you have a very special case where all variables diffuse at the same rate, which is almost almost impossible to happen, uh, then then all three of these directions that I'm going to talk about are equivalent. But in general, when you have different diffusivities for motion in different directions, the flux direction is not the same as the reaction coordinate. And the, the, mean, the minimum free energy path is neither the flux nor the reaction coordinate. It's somewhere between the two. You basically scratch off the diffusion matrix from those eigenvalue equations, and that gives you the MFEP through the saddle point. So the MFEP, uh, which is computed, for example, in, in uh, metadynamics uh, path variables and in the string method, is, is giving you neither the flux direction nor the reaction coordinate. Further analysis required to extract those things 
uh, from this object. And the committer is the correct reaction coordinate for these overdamped problems. So all of this stuff sort of follows from the analysis in, in uh, this paper in 2005. Uh, OK, so a couple of sort of pitfalls, therefore, to, to look out for. Uh, nobody's giggling about this picture, but I think it's, I think it's really funny. Uh, OK, so um, all right, so uh, the flux direction is what you see if you watch movies of the transition paths. The MFEP direction is what you get if you ignore dynamics altogether, right? And just look at free characteristics of the free energy surface. Uh, the, uh, I think it's important to remember that we should not infer the reaction coordinate from either of these objects because unless we have this very special case, it'll steer us in the wrong direction. Right? So, uh, all right, so KLBS theory, a few practical notes here, starts from a high dimensional coordinate. Yeah. MFEP uh, is the minimum free energy path. So, so uh, uh, I can sketch it. Um, it's a steepest descent path in the space of collective variables. So Q1, Q2, suppose I've got uh, um, a surface that looks like this. Try and make this uh, look interesting. Here's, here's B, here's A, here's a transition state. And if I compute the steepest descent path in these two variables, it should do like this, and we call this thing the MFEP, right? So there are prescriptions for predicting the committer from the MFEP and uh, characteristics of the geometry in these two in these two coordinates. Uh, I'm sure Eric will show you those from the string method. Uh, the, the you know one thing to note is that the committer isosurfaces may not be perpendicular to the path. I'll let Eric uh, uh, tell you all of that stuff, but um, but if you just look uh, at the tangent direction along the path, it's not really the, the right direction to say the how is the committer changing is actually you know perpendicular to these surfaces, which are not necessarily uh, along the path. Is that it's steepest descent in the space of the two. So it's a collective variable of steepest descent, which introduces a lot of complications that, uh, that Eric has has worked out in a 2006 paper, and I. I am almost 100% certain that that was something that he will show. Actually, Cam showed you uh, an example of using the MFEP in his talk. Uh, okay. Okay, so uh, KLBS theory starts from this high dimensional coordinate and uh, the free energy surface as a function of that high dimensional coordinate and a high dimensional diffusion tensor. Okay? These are very, very difficult objects to get, right? So I think that. Uh, either Maximo or Giovanni, one of them, I remember, told you that basically when we set out to compute free energy landscapes, somebody asked how many variables can we use? Usually two or three, right? Uh, if you're doing something along a, along a path in very special cases, you might be able to go to more. But usually we're limited by two or three variables. So already when you, when you go from, say, a, a system with 100,000 dimensions down to, to selecting two, it's hard to pick the right two, right? So, so this is a bit of a, a bit of a, a beautiful, elegant theory, but in practice, it's a kind of a non-starter, right? So we, we can't really hope to get exact answers by doing this in practice. So what can we do instead? Uh, well, we can. Um, okay, Brian. Um, I, uh, okay, so um, what we can do instead is we can use methods that that give us rates that do not depend on which reaction coordinate we pick. Uh, there are such methods: transition path sampling transition interface sampling and forward flux sampling, which are all path sampling methods, uh, give rate constants that are, that are unchanged if you change the reaction coordinate. Right? So this is a, this is a very, very powerful set of methods, actually, um, that were developed um, you know, starting in around 1998 with this one. And this one, I think, this FFS was the last of these to come out. It was in 2005. Uh, so this is one option, right? We can just say, forget the reaction coordinate, too difficult to find. Uh, we're just going to go with these kinds of methods. Uh, however, the rates are always magnifying our force field errors, and, uh, and we don't trust the absolute values of the rates. What we trust is more trends and uh, the mechanistic insight that comes from knowing what is the reaction coordinate. For example, if you know the reaction coordinate, you can say, what do all transition states have in common? They have in common one value of the reaction coordinate, right? Uh, how can, if I know that they all have in common this one physical feature, 
then I can make predictions about what kinds of changes to my experimental system will modify the free energy of states that have that feature. Right? So you can make predictions about how you might lower the free energy barrier uh, or, or raise the free energy barrier if you want to shut that pathway off. You can also answer uh, questions that are perhaps a little more esoteric, but things that I like, about uh, what is the nature of the dynamics along the correct reaction coordinate, right? which is really not possible because coordinate error and natural dynamics are, are muddled together, for example, in the, in the transmission coefficient framework. So it's only by finding a, a correct reaction coordinate that we can really answer questions about the dynamics. And, and you know, just to sort of summarize what I'm saying here, this is what people did for the past many years, right? Is they, they built reaction rate theories around the idea that there was one, one coordinate. And uh, fortunately, they've been in, in many cases uh, that that, that, uh, that was correct. Uh, but you know, basically, all of these pre-2000 rate theories are based on this idea of a reaction coordinate and dimensionality reduction. Uh, so we have two options. We can run giant simulations, just try and get rates, uh, forget about reaction coordinates and all the insight that comes along with them. Uh, perhaps you, you could argue that you know things like uh, the so the framework that Eric will show you uh, will say keep all the coordinates and solve a high dimensional backward Kolmogorov partial differential equation, and you can get rates from that as well, right? Uh, so you know, or we can say let's really try to learn how we can reduce these high dimensional problems to one or two dimensions, make a connection to these. Uh, rate theories that allow us to do all these things uh, to Schmolakowski equations, Fokker Planck equations, etc. And, and you know, you can probably get an idea from my talk so far that I'm very much in this camp. These days, with faster and faster computers, I'm, I'm increasingly outnumbered. Uh, but, but I think that this is the important stuff, right? This is what simulations are supposed to give us is insight and understanding that we can use to make predictions. And, uh, and we just can't get that from large simulations, you know, computing K at different conditions, for example. Uh, OK, so my fellow Missourian, I'm from Missouri in the US. Now, people don't really know that T.S. Eliot was born and spent his childhood there. Uh, but he said, where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? And that's sort of my argument, right? So these, these methods that don't depend on rate on the coordinates are, are wonderful. Uh, and methods like uh, transition path theory are wonderful. But what we really want is low-dimensional representations that can that can boil down the many-body problem into something we can understand. And uh, so here's another quote: "You should stop advocating the work of dead people; they will never help you." That's my wife. Uh, she's a very practical person. Uh, and uh, and so I um you know I, I agree with her. And in that spirit, uh, my talk will really begin with using these kinds of frameworks that don't depend on what coordinate you have to try to solve this problem, to reduce the, reduce the dimensionality. So people have always looked at these things as a way of getting rate constants without knowing the coordinate. I'm going to use these methods as a way of getting coordinates when you don't know the coordinate. Okay. So transition path sampling is where the story begins. Uh, how am I doing on time? Anybody, anybody happen to know? Anybody? 10. Ten. Okay. Uh, so transition path sampling uh, was the first of these methods. It uh, it still is a rare events method. It's going to capitalize on time scale separation. It allows you to circumvent needing to know the reaction coordinate, still get the rates and transition paths. And here is this idea of a transition path, right? So it's a path that leaves state A and goes to state B without ever revisiting state A. Okay. Uh, and what is what is unique about path sampling methods is that they preserve the true dynamics. So we're not in any way you know, the, the, uh, the various biasing schemes, they all change the dynamics, and the dynamics through those processes are lost. In transition path sampling, the dynamics are, are retained uh, because we're actually sampling. It's a Monte Carlo procedure for sampling dynamical pathways. Okay? So it is exactly analogous to Metropolis Monte Carlo. You have, uh, you, have a you have a restriction that these paths should start in state A and end in state B. Probability of starting at this location in state A and uh, transition probabilities for all the time steps that happen between the beginning and the end of the path. So this object plays the role of the Boltzmann factor that you would have if you were doing uh, if you were doing Metropolis Monte Carlo, we would be sampling configurations, accepting or rejecting them. Here we're sampling dynamical trajectories and uh, accepting or rejecting them uh, using a similar kind of framework. To do that, we need a detailed balance criteria. 
Uh, so this is detailed balance for the transition path ensemble. It looks exactly the same as detailed balance for the metropolis, uh, Monte Carlo, and configuration space, except that these objects are paths. Okay, they stand for an entire trajectory. So that, you know, either one of the dotted lines, which would not be accepted because it's not a transition path, or one of these, which might be accepted because it is a transition path. Okay, and we need an ergodic set of moves that allow us to, in principle, uh, sample all possible paths. Okay, and that was first done uh, in this paper, uh, in this paper by, well, I don't have it referenced, um, and there's an earlier paper, 1998, uh, by, uh, by Blackhouse and Delano, uh, and Chandler. Uh, so this is, um, this is shooting and shifting. This was their way of, of doing it. So the basic idea is you take an initial path, you pick a point along that path, you make a small modification to the momentum, and you fire trajectory forward and backward from that point, and if you reconnect A to B, uh, for these particular moves, the acceptance probability reduces all the way down to one factor, and that is does the new path connect A to B, right? So you can, you can design your uh, path generation moves so that all of these factors cancel, and the acceptance becomes very, very simple. Okay, so it was a, it was a pretty celebrated method for, uh, for a few years, so everybody was really excited about it. They thought, you know, this is very different, and we're not changing the dynamics anymore, and this is going to solve everything. Uh, but then people started to run into problems, right? So as they moved beyond things like seven Leonard Jones atoms in two dimensions doing rearrangements, they found that there were a lot of problems with this transition path sampling framework of a purely practical nature. So the formalism was fine, uh, but, but the, uh, the convergence and the efficiency of sampling uh, became, became really bad. And that was voiced in a couple of these papers. Uh, Don Frinkel. Uh, pointed out that transition path sampling efficiency basically drops to zero if the process has a transition path time, that is the time to fall down off the top of the barrier. If that gets to be longer than a picosecond, uh, all bets are off. You're probably not going to have any accepted paths because they will all go back to the state where they started. Uh, and then uh, um, Chandler himself pointed out that, you know, it's true we can get rate constants uh, and transition paths, but what we really wanted is the right collective variables, and we only have this trial and error procedure for finding them, right? So you guess a collective variable, and you can check to see whether that guess was correct, okay? And Peter Ballhouse noted that, you know, the problem with this trial and error procedure is really that it's extremely costly to test a single guess, right? So you're, you're guessing, you're testing, uh, you're spending a lot of money to test one guess, and you find out usually that your guess was wrong. Uh, because I think that one of the things that people learned in these early studies was that it's a lot harder to guess coordinates than they thought. Uh, okay? So, what do we mean when we say a good coordinate versus bad coordinate? Well, it all comes back to this committer probability idea. We know that that is the, uh, the exact reaction coordinate. And, uh, well, the exact reaction coordinate for, for many problems. There are cases with ballistic motion where it might not be the ideal thing. Uh, okay, so, um, so this is what should happen in a, in a, in a case where you've picked a good coordinate, right? So suppose we want to want to uh, try and hypothesize that Q1 is the right reaction coordinate in this multidimensional. There's only two here, but imagine there are many. We're going to project the free the, the energy landscape onto a free energy in this one dimension uh, Q1. Okay. So if you've got a good coordinate, then all of the states. Uh, so the top of this barrier corresponds to a value Q1 which in the multidimensional landscape corresponds to a whole manifold of states that are all transition states, right? A whole surface of things where this is a transition state, this is a transition state, that's a transition state, etc. right? Uh, that actually should be true for every point along this thing, but this is sort of the most critical place to get right. And this is what happens when you have a bad coordinate, right? So the same free energy landscape, everything can look perfectly fine. Uh, particularly if you have these advanced sampling methods, it's really good to be able to converge free energy calculations even when you have bad coordinates. But it has a, a dark side, and that's that it can convince you this looks good, right? But in the multidimensional landscape, it's bad, right? Why is it bad? Because the top of this barrier corresponds to states that are on the edge of A or on the edge of B, and very few that are actually transition states, right? So if I you know, this point, which is almost never visited, is high on this ridge, is a true transition state with a PB of one half. Half the trajectories will go this way and half will go that way. Over here, which is most of the population, they all go to B. And over here, another part of the population, they all go to A. So we can quantify that idea 
by computing for every point on our on our transferring surface the committer distribution. So here are these committers. We're going to take points and we're going to fire off these trajectories and keep a histogram of uh, of where they went. Right. So here's this this bad coordinate case, and what you see is that. There are a lot of states like this where all of the trajectories go to state B. And those will fall over here in the histogram where they all have, all the states up here have PB values that are near 1. Okay? Over here on the edge of A, all of these states have PB values that are near 0. And so that creates another peak in the histogram uh, that's near 0. Right? So when you see this bimodal histogram, that means you've got a bad coordinate. Right? Uh, very, very stringent criteria. It really, really, you know, this is sort of the, the most stringent thing that, that you can look at. And, uh, and the problem is that you spent about 100,000 trajectories computing this test. Okay? And often you find out that you were wrong. This is, of course, you know, if you somehow had the, the uh, stroke of insight to guess that your coordinate was some mixture of Q2 and Q1 that gives isosurfaces like this, you would find that all the points on this dotted line have committers that are near one half, and that gives a histogram that looks like that. And you say success, yay! We we understand exactly how uh, how this uh, we basically understand the full mechanism of this of this problem now. Okay, so let me give you an example just to convey that it's uh it's really really easy to get these things wrong, and even in cases where you think surely that's the reaction coordinate, right? If you look at ion pair dissociation, so you've got sodium and chloride in water. Uh, they have two stable states, one where the ions are in contact with each other, one where the ions move apart from each other, and uh, they're then solved and separated. Okay, so, so this has a few practical applications, but, but the real interest in this is, is a toy problem for solving, uh, for finding reaction coordinates. Okay, so, uh, so it seems like a very easy problem. You'd think, well, what is the reaction coordinate for this thing? First guess. Somebody has a guess, surely. You know that your guess is going to be wrong. Maybe that's why nobody is guessing, right? Uh, all right. So the obvious coordinate that you would pick is how far apart are the two ions, right? Uh, well, people tried that. This is uh, I don't have the reference here. Um, my VPN stopped working last night, and I couldn't get references from the library. Uh, but Phil Geisler wrote this paper uh, back in 1999. He showed that uh, that if you if you look in here, the free energy barrier is at 3.7 angstroms. So you prepare an ensemble of, of configurations with the ions held at angstrom, compute committer probabilities for all those, and you find uh, a bimodal histogram, right? So, so his was even even worse than this. This is ours. Uh, but the point is, is this is not that case where you've got a peak in the middle at 0.5. And so that tells you that it's not the distance between the two ions. So what is it? It has to be what the solvents are doing, right? The only coordinate characterizing solute configuration is the distance between the two ions. So it must be a solvent coordinate that explains this. And so I think that really illustrates how remarkably difficult it is to guess coordinates. Even when your intuition tells you surely the distance between the two ions is important, often we find that that's wrong. Okay? So can this test be made less expensive? Uh, so, so this was work that, that we did back in 2006. Uh, you can, so this is what I showed you. Here's how the original test went. This is what the Chandler uh, group started doing back in the late 90s. Uh, and what they're doing is computing a histogram of committer probability estimates by doing this binomial sampling procedure at every one of the configurations on their surface, right? So there's an underlying committer probability is a continuous object, right? It's not a discrete, discrete thing. So, so there is some continuous committer distribution that lives in the, in the real problem. We don't know what it is. We have no direct way of accessing it. But we can compute these histograms of these committer estimates by firing many trajectories. Uh, so the, what, I, what I noted back in 2006 was that if you know that this converts into this by a binomial convolution, right? Each of these estimates, you're estimating how many out of, out of say, 100 trajectories go to state B. That's a binomial random variable, right? It takes values between 0 and 100 integers. So we can actually reverse that and go backwards, right? We can deconvolute the binomial sampling error from the histogram and you can't get the distribution, but you can get all of its moments, right? In fact, you can get the mean and the very precisely with a very cheap calculation, right? So, so they were really burning. Uh, 
with about 10,000 trajectories, you can get the physically important variable. That is, the width of this distribution uh, comes at a tremendously cheaper cost, and it is, uh, it is everything that you need to know. Right? So if this thing is too wide, it's a bad coordinate. If it's, if it's narrow enough, you have to be happy. Okay? So that allows you to very quickly go through and test coordinates. Right? So you still see papers in the literature that say, um, we didn't test the coordinate because it's too expensive. Uh, it's kind of a mini excuse now uh, because, because the test is not expensive at all. Right? So this is actually much cheaper than the calculations that people are, are doing and uh, are doing in those same papers. And, uh, and so you know, the, the point I would make here is that even though the test is very, very inexpensive now, it's still quite difficult to pass, right? You still, this doesn't tell you how to find the right coordinate. Uh, so I, I make somewhat of a nuisance of myself uh, in the field um, by really pestering people that you should test your coordinates. And, I, and I, I, I want to convey to you why I make a nuisance of myself on this topic. Um, it, it's because at the beginning of a paper, when you say, I think the, the, the committer probability, which is the reaction coordinate, depends on these collective variables, right? And then you, you use a computational framework or a mathematical framework, and you, you, you plow through many pages of analysis and many, many hours of CPU time, and you generate results from that framework, right? All of those results hinge upon whether you picked the right variable again. Essentially, whether your mechanistic hypothesis that this is the collective variable that matters was the correct one, right? So at the end of the paper, to not test the mechanistic hypothesis that you made on page one is sort of throwing away the science part of the study, in my view. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty dogmatic about this, but I think that at the end of the day, you know, we want to develop methods and we want to develop theories, but when we take those methods and theories into applications and draw conclusions from them, it's very important that we test the underlying assumptions. And the underlying assumptions are mechanistic hypotheses. It's essential in science, of course, that we test the hypothesis. Otherwise, it's only a partially completed piece of work. Uh, so so you, can, you can get an idea that I am a nuisance on this topic and that I, I really believe that this is an essential thing uh, that people should, should do uh, more often. Uh, so this problem uh, is resolved, right? So this is... Uh, this is basically where I'm going to have an intermission here. We now can test our coordinates quite cheaply using this binomial deconvolution procedure. And, uh, and so, intermission. Okay? So, uh, so the, the original version of transition path sampling I mentioned had some, uh, some, some sampling efficiency issues uh, when the transition paths became long. And uh, you know, in an effort to try and uh, come up with a version of transition path sampling that would uh, give us the information that we needed to find reaction coordinates, uh, I, in full disclosure, we sort of inadvertently stumbled onto this trick uh, that makes transition path sampling very efficient for those things that it used to have difficulty doing. And, uh, and so the, the basic idea is, is this aimless shooting algorithm. Uh, and uh, you know, aimless shooting because we're no longer making small displacements to the momenta at the point where we shoot. Instead, we are completely drawing them again from the Boltzmann distribution. You would think that that now makes my probability of reaching state B from some distant point smaller. However, we also change the way we choose the point from which we shoot. Okay? So the combination of these two things uh, is actually what, what saves the day. Uh, so, so the trajectories go um, from, from 0 to t. And we can think of a trajectory then as having uh, a portion. So a given trajectory has three segments. There's a part of length t over 2. There's another part of length t over 2 over here. And there's a part uh, of length delta t right here in the middle. Right? And so we've always got you know, the, the origin, the end, and these two candidate shooting points in this algorithm. And as transition path sampling occurs, you're doing a random walk in the space of dynamical pathways, but you're also doing a random walk in the space of these shooting points, right? This little pair of, 
of states is moving around as new trajectories are, are generated from the old ones. And you can analyze, and this is what we did in 2006, we, you know, I thought about this problem, where are these little points going? I don't know why I thought about this, uh, but it, it turns out to be kind of a useful direction to think uh, because, because what happens is that you can, you can prove that the, the location in space that's visited by these two points um, these are the shooting points. In the original transition path sampling algorithm, the points where you were shooting also dance around in space. And they dance anywhere in the region of the transition pathway. So if you think about typical transition paths taking some path through, uh, through configuration space on their way from A to B, uh, in the original transition path sampling, these points are sort of uniformly spread out all the way across this, this region. Uh, in the aimless shooting algorithm, the way they're generated and, and uh, accepted, uh, which does satisfy detailed balance um, in the path ensemble, automatically generates most of the points in the region, still within the pathway, but also along the pathway where you have a high probability of, of generating a new trajectory. So why is that? Uh, you, can, you can show that the distribution of where these two points go is given by the probability of being on a transition path, given that you're at x, and the probability of x, given that you're on a transition path. Okay, so what do those two things mean? This one, the second one, is the same as what we had in the original transition path sampling algorithm. It says that the points that you shoot from are along transition paths, and so if you know where the transition paths are, they, they sort of define this pathway, it's anywhere, anywhere in that region, right? This first one is new to aimless shooting, and uh, is, which is a transition path sampling algorithm. It's just a special variety. Uh, so uh, it says that that the the uh, that it's also multiplied by the probability of being on a transition path given that you were at x. Okay, so that confines the distribution to the region right where everything's happening, right? And uh, and this is sort of a fortuitous outcome uh, that allows this algorithm to be efficient even for uh, long diffusive. Uh, transition paths. That is, paths that wander around on top of the barrier for a very, very long time uh, and, uh, and then eventually fall off into states A and B. Aimless shooting remains efficient for those processes and uh, that's something that we worked on quite a bit. Um, and uh, this algorithm sort of resolved it uh, by accident. Um, so this is uh, just showing, um, we will do some work with that algorithm. We'll talk about it in the workshop today. Uh, this is showing the uh, distribution of those shooting points, you see that they sort of automatically gravitate. We don't have to tell the algorithm where the transition region is, where the bottleneck is. The shooting points just automatically start falling there, right? And uh, I've colored them red and green. So in the original transition path sampling framework, the focus was on the trajectories themselves, right? Here, we don't care so much about the trajectories. We care about the outcomes of the shooting moves because the outcomes of the shooting moves are like flipping a coin once, a biased coin, and seeing did it come out B or A, which is a realization of the committer probability. And that's what we want to learn using these informatics procedures that I'll show you in a short. So these guys are, are automatically populating this region of the, of the transition pathway, and they're colored red if they went to B, and green if the resulting trajectory went to A. Okay? So uh, this is a rather simple example where the original transition path sampling would have done just fine. Uh, but as you go to these processes that take longer than a picosecond, you see that this one takes 400 picosecond uh, to fall down off the top of the barrier. That's our measure of the transition path time. And, uh, and so in these kinds of processes, um, you know, transition path sampling used to have a lot of sampling problems. And you can see here that we're still getting about 30% acceptance for these kinds of things, uh, which really opens the door to doing transition path sampling, uh, not... not uh, and not throwing away the dynamics for, for processes that are actually of uh, pretty reasonable complexity. So, um, so I, I, that, was, that was quite exciting, and this was work with, uh, with Greg Beckham uh, in this paper in uh, 2011. Okay, so, um, so I, I should note that there are other methods that have evolved uh, that also solve this sampling efficiency problem. Transition interface sampling and forward flux sampling also do a very good job at resolving this. They are very different kinds of algorithms, right? So Titus Van Erp has uh, summarized this uh, very, very uh, succinctly. He said, transition path sampling, in the original sense, is Monte Carlo in the space of dynamical paths. And 
TIS, Transition Interface Sampling, which TITUS invented, uh, and FFS, which other people invented, are umbrella sampling schemes in the space of dynamical paths. Okay? So I'm not going to spend too much time talking about these TIS and FFS methods, uh, but, but they are very powerful. And uh, if your goal is just to get a rate, uh, they, are, they are definitely things to, uh, to go and read. Um, all right, so we have this last remaining problem, and that is how do you, uh, how do you find the right collective variables? Uh, so aimless shooting, uh, I pointed out, automatically generates this uh, swarm of shooting points, and the outcomes of those shooting points can be classified. Did it go to B or did it go to A? And then we can sit down in a brainstorming session and list you know, some thousand mechanistic hypotheses and uh, formulate little simple models based on each one. We actually use an automated script to go through and do that. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm really bad at that, as you'll learn in the workshop, but my students help me. And, uh, and so uh, basically what we do is we say, you know, what if the reaction coordinate depends on Q, uh, Q1? What if it depends on Q2? What if it depends on both of them together? Uh, we can build simple models. Uh, that try and try and represent all these different possibilities with some adjustable parameters, and and then uh, a model uh, function describes. This is represented by this little black curve here. It's something that that uh, so this is basically a basis that allows us to find the region in phase space that we don't know ahead of time, where the committer probability goes from zero, starts to go upward towards one, right? And the direction in phase space is given by the direction in which things turn from green to red in this diagram, right? So how do we find that and when we're talking, you know, you can see the answer here we're in two dimensions. You can look at it and know exactly what direction is the reaction coordinate. Uh, but if you're in 100,000 dimensions, things are much more difficult. Fortunately, likelihood maximization uh, can see it. So we take all of the realizations of the committer probability that went to state B and we uh, evaluate their likelihood of having come out that way this, with this expression. All the ones that went to state A are plugged into this expression. So this is the, so this is basically representing the probability that if this model was correct, the data would look like this. Okay, so we have a set of data that has nothing to do with what, crea what reaction coordinates we're going to pose. We have a set of reaction coordinates that includes, you know, a long, long list that would take, you know, years and decades to test by the old approach. And uh, and we're going to screen all of them to find the one that explains this swarm of data. That's the basic idea, right? So it's a data mining exercise, effectively. We're looking for the mechanistic hypothesis that's consistent with the outcome of the actual dynamics. Okay? So, uh, emphasizing this point again, that, that uh, testing coordinates is related to hypothesis testing, and is really doing a high throughput uh, test of many, many hypotheses. This is a compilation of coordinates that have been investigated to try and understand Leonard Jones nucleation. So you take a supercooled Leonard Jones fluid and uh, and you um, uh, you study the the process by which that that uh, grows the first nucleus of, of of an FCC crystal in this fluid. And uh, people have thought about this. It's been kind of a guinea pig for for analysis of uh, of nucleation problems for a long time, going back to 1981. First papers on this. Uh, to my knowledge, and uh, and so you know what we did was we looked in all of these papers and tried to make a uh, a full list of all the coordinates that different people have thought about. Uh, there are coordinates from Lechner and Delago. Uh, the most widely used one is this one by Frankel. Uh, there are coordinates from from Michaela. There are some that Greg and I added, um, and uh, there are all of these Steinhardt order parameters and various variations on those things. Okay, so so there's some 60 coordinates here. And uh, they would take a long, long time to test them individually. The likelihood maximization can do it in about five minutes. Uh, and literally what it's doing is it's, it's asking for every individual coordinate how, how good of a, a reaction coordinate model can be made from that collective variable. And it scans all the individuals. Then it scans all the pairs. And it compares the best pair to the best individual. Right? There's a statistical criteria called the Bayesian information criterion. It says that if the log likelihood score goes up by a BIC, this Bayesian information criteria, uh, then the improvement is significant, right? And adding the extra complexity to involve two collective variables instead of one is giving you physically meaningful improvement, right? So that's the, the basic idea. Uh, so so we, uh, we went through and, and scanned all of just the individual coordinates in this case. And uh, 
and sort of, it was an accident, actually, uh, that we discovered this one. Um, so uh, the, the story, since Michaela's here, I'll tell the story of how this happened. Uh, Michaela has a coordinate on this list that uh, is the average coordination number of solid particles, okay? And you know, I don't think that, you know, he was using this in, con in combination with many other things, and uh, himself, I think, didn't really expect that this was the reaction coordinate for the problem. Greg and I wrote, wrote the, uh, the subroutines to compute all of these order parameters, took a lot of work, and, uh, and this one, in the analysis, popped up as the best coordinate. And we thought, it doesn't have anything to do with nucleus size, why is this the best coordinate, right? And, uh, and what we found was that we had forgotten to normalize the average by the number of particles in the nucleus, okay? So, so that told us something, right? We discovered something useful, and that was that if you take nucleus size, as measured by Don Frinkel, and multiply it by structure coordinates, you get something that really, really does way better than all the coordinates that people have thought about in the past. Okay? So we did that for all of the structural coordinates. We took them all and we multiplied them by nucleus size. And this one came out on top then. Uh, so it is Don Frankel's nucleus size coordinate multiplied by Peter Bullhouse's internal structure coordinate according to the Steinhardt uh, Q6 parameter. Okay? So complicated thing, but it's basically looking at how well packed the atoms are and simultaneously at how many atoms are involved in the nucleus. Right? And, uh, and so this is uh, the um, the uh, landscape showing uh, these points over here colored red melt back to the liquid state. The points over here colored blue continue to grow on and make a solid block of crystal in our simulation. And, uh, and so this is the dividing surface. It involves both nucleus size and this Q6 uh, coordinate. Okay? Is it right? Yes, it is. You can validate this uh, and show that uh, you know using that committer analysis with the histogram test, uh, you see here that it's actually remarkably accurate. It's, uh, it's only uh, about 12% error in this distribution for predicting the PD values. Okay, so, um, so that just shows you how we can you know, take a, a lot of ideas about, about what variables are important in a process, screen them all very quickly, and, uh, and find the right one uh, that you can then go on and use for all later analysis. Right? So now, you know, we know the system that's an, that's an exaggeration, an accidental exaggeration. It's 40,000 degrees of freedom. Uh, but the point is you're going from tens of thousands of degrees of freedom down to one, and you have the only one that matters in the process, right? So now if you want to do uh, metadynamics or, or, uh, or umbrella sampling or whatever method of choice you have, you can use this variable, plug it in, and it will give you answers that are actually kinetically relevant, right? So the free energy landscape that you get, you can read the the rates off of it by uh, just thinking about mobility in that one direction. Okay, so uh, likelihood maximization um, I think goes a long way towards resolving this problem. In the in the past few years, many people have been thinking about this. Uh, Ma and Denner made a sort of seminal contribution uh, with a neural network fit by least squares analysis in 2005. That was the the first one of these, and uh, and Borrero and Escobedo have one. Bullhouse has one that's based on likelihood maximization. And uh, I think that one that does something that, uh, that we cannot do, and that's address sort of problems of the complexity of like protein folding kind of level, is Cecilia Clementi. Her diffusion maps approach is, is incredibly powerful. Um, it it uh, is limited to processes with uh, diffusive dynamics over the barrier. Ours can do diffusive or ballistic, uh, but hers does uh, really complicated processes better than ours does, I, w I would freely admit. Um, for reviews on this stuff, uh, which I think is, is pretty important, you can see uh, our review or, or Ballhouse and Delago. So, you know, is transition path sampling the Cadillac of reaction dynamics methods? Well, you know, certainly now we can address this, and we can address this, and this was something that people never really envisioned would be possible, I think, in the beginning of transition path sampling. So, so it's gone a long way from where it was in the beginning. Of course, it still has its limitations. It doesn't work for everything. As I just noted, Cecilia does things that I think transition path sampling can never touch. The time scales are just way too long, and the, and the reaction coordinates are way too difficult to, uh, to even come up with in a brainstorming session. It's, uh, it's um, you know, her, her thing is, yeah, yeah. Um, at what points in this process are you doing simulations? Like, I'm not quite so clear about that. Yeah. Okay. In the process, we do all of our simulations to get this 
swarm of, of shooting points, right? So the transition path sampling simulation at the beginning generates this data. We never have to do another simulation. Everything else is, is uh, going and sitting down and saying, what are all the coordinates that could be important, right? And, uh, and then testing those, those coordinates, right? Which the test at this stage is just running likelihood maximization. It's, it's a, you'll use it today. It's a, it takes a, it takes a you know, couple seconds to run uh, for the problem that you'll work on. And, uh, and so it's, uh, it's really fast. You know, there is one last step that does involve simulations, and that's likelihood maximization will only give you the best coordinate in the set of, in the set of options that you gave it to choose from, right? So if, if you left out the right collective variable uh, in the list of a thousand that you wrote down, which is entirely possible, you can just completely miss it sometimes, uh, it will only give you the best of that thousand. It can't go and discover the one you didn't tell it about, right? So that would be really nice if we had the ability to do that, but I don't think we do yet. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's useful then to still go back and test the coordinate to make sure the best coordinate out of the thousand was actually still a good coordinate, right? So you did this without Q2 and Q1, or you just kind of picked a Q2 and Q1 and then went about all of your analysis with just a bunch of other ones? Or like, I'm just not exactly sure about how you got that data in the first place. Uh, okay, so the, the paths are computed in the, these paths are trajectories x of t, right? They're three in dimension, right? And these points that I'm showing are those points projected onto the, onto the screen. And we've taken, uh, in that representation, it's q2 of each of the points, right? So this is the kth shooting point. Uh, and here is the, uh, the kth shooting point as well, but now computing coordinate q1, right? So for every set of coordinates that I, that I pick uh, to examine, the swarm of points will move, around, right? They look different, right? And, uh, and the key thing is when they look different, do they look different in the sense that the ones that are going to be are separating from the ones that are going to A, right? If they're totally overlapping, then a free energy calculation, all the things that you guys have learned so far, might show you a free energy landscape that looks reasonable, but it's, it's mixing in the projection the region that corresponds to B with the region that corresponds to A. And, uh, and so the dynamics on that surface will not be the dynamics of the real inner conversions, right? Does that, does that make sense? So it's the it's the you're looking for this separation. The green and the red should not be on top of each other, but should be shifted from one another a little bit, right? Yeah. So you start up with some initial guess. I'm correct if I'm wrong. You start up with some initial guess, and then you guess on Q1 and Q2, and then you sort of refine those those. You, you can do that. You can say, oh, that was a, I mean, that's basically what we did when we saw Perinello's coordinate came up uh, really, really good. We thought, oh, what is Perinello's coordinate? When we miscoded Perinello's coordinate, what does that mean, right? And then we said, if that worked, then we should go in and see if, if there are other similar kinds of things that we can try. So yeah, you can iteratively go through and, uh, and add new coordinates to your set. You never have to regenerate these points. They are, they are set once and for all. This is the data. The game is trying to find a coordinate that explains that data then. So how, how sure are you that Q2 and Q1 will for sure generate this form of data points? Don't know. If I pick, if I pick terrible coordinates, uh, they will just be all over the place, right? And they'll be overlapping all over the place, right? Which is even worse. Okay? So, you know, you're never really looking at this swarm. This object, when you optimize this, it just tells you for this pair of coordinates, this is the best you can separate the swarm of points with a model like this. And, and then you compare the result for this pair of coordinates to umpteen other pairs, and you can see what is the best pair then, right? That make sense? So, like, essentially, you're just starting here, like a liquid, and then it's, it's crystallizing, and that's going to A or B. Yeah. And you just analyze all that data with the reaction coordinates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, 
So I want to now come back to this uh, this problem uh, that has remained unsolved for a very, very long time. Uh, it's this ion pair dissociation problem. I mentioned in the beginning that the distance between the two ions is not the, the right reaction point for this problem, but people have never been able to figure out what exactly the solvent is doing. Uh, and so uh, I showed you that the histogram test confirms our ion is not, is not the full story. There's at least something else uh, that's important here. And we ran likelihood maximization and aimless shooting on this problem. And we found something that looked very promising, right? So this is uh, telling us that it's the distance between the ions. OK, that's an important coordinate. It's in the, it's in the set. Uh, but there are other ones as well. Uh, so we found that this, uh, this R opt coordinate was also important. And the NB coordinate, which is a joint coordination number for uh, waters being connected to both of the two ions by, uh, by uh, you know, local coordination uh, number. OK, so, uh, so here you've got our ion versus this NB coordinate, which uh, as a coordination number, we can interpret it as a continuous version of an integer. Uh, so uh, if that makes any sense at all. Uh, so, so the NB0, our ion small, looks like the two ions are associated and no water will fit in between them. And, uh, and so that's this point down here. When you move out to there, the ions are broken apart. But what you see now, so likelihood maximization identifies the coordinates. And then we go back and we say, ah, so these things must be important. What does the free energy landscape look like in, in that uh, space? And, and now you start to get understanding, right? So now you see that in order to go from here to here, it looks like uh, the ions allow a water to come in, and then they can move across. Or they can allow two waters to come in and move across. And if they allow zero waters to move in, they, they just move across this bottom axis, right? Depending on the number of waters that they involve in this transition state, the location of the transition state along the R coordinate moves. Okay? So if you'd taken this whole graph and projected it down onto here, this is why you see things at small, things well below 3.7 angstroms that are already in state A. For example, if you were on this pathway, that's all going back to here. If you're, if, even if you're all the way out at 4, if you're on this pathway, you're going on, but if you're here, you might still go back this direction, right? So the it's the smooshing three, three chosen reaction coordinates that's obscuring uh, the dynamics, and uh, we can we can test that and see that the the uh, the this is not as good as we would like to get, right? This is uh, this is not very peaked, but it's certainly better than what people have seen in the past. And uh, we tested some 230 coordinates here, and this is as we could get. Uh, so so we thought. You know, well, that's, that's pretty exciting. At least we're starting to get the, the right picture now. And so I, I uh, thought, let's try and go back to this paper by Pollock in 1986. Pollock wrote a paper that I, I really like. Um, it, uh, it says that these generalized Langevin models, which I, I guess you guys haven't, haven't learned those yet. Um, OK, I'm, I'm sorry for this one. Uh, so the generalized Langevin model is just a, a friction uh, it's a Langevin equation, but it has some memory of the past, unlike the, the uh, Markovian friction that you guys learned uh, when Giovanni uh, showed you this stuff on the first night. Uh, so so what, what Pollock um, did was he, he noted this result from Zwanzig that said uh, you could always take these kinds of models that people know describe the kinetics uh, of ion pair dissociation pretty well. Uh, he said that you could always take these things and map them onto a, a set of harmonic oscillators that's coupled to your R ion coordinate, right? And then he said, you know, that given the properties of these models, which we know very well, you can always rotate the reaction coordinate to include some component along those harmonic oscillator degrees of freedom. And then transition state theory becomes the harmonic transition state theory result in that model, and it's exact again, right? So this was sort of interesting because it suggests that if we could find these kinds of coordinates that describe what the solvent is doing, then we might be able to apply transition state theory to a process where it seems not to work, but with a new coordinate it might work perfectly well again. Right? So I was very interested to see whether, whether this could happen in a real problem. And, and so uh, we went and we, we tried it. Remember, this is this transmission coefficient stuff. Pollock is saying that if you find the right solvent coordinate, uh, that, that perhaps kappa will just become 1 again, right? Which means the transition state theory is exact if this curve just stays at 1. OK? And here's what we got. It got worse. OK? So this was quite a surprise. This uh, 
this puzzled us for like six months. We, uh, we really struggled with how to interpret this result, right? So here's likelihood maximization is giving us this coordinate Q. Uh, here's our ion. Kappa for our ion is already better than kappa for Q, okay? So this was really a puzzle, right? So, so what, it, what it suggests is that somehow the criteria for reaction coordinate accuracy that, that Wigner put, put forth back in the 40s, uh, which says the reaction coordinate should be chosen to maximize the transmission coefficient, is somehow uh, perhaps you know, in conflict when you optimize them with the uh, criteria that people have been using goes back to Onsager, but you know, Pandy, Chandler, Eric Van Eenden, and Zabo have all proposed that you know, we should find coordinates that are, that are accurate predictors of the committer probability. Okay, so likelihood maximization is doing this, right? Uh, variational transition state theory is doing this. And we know that this procedure, if you have ballistic dynamics, which certainly for two ions that have to move apart, same, same argument as for the, uh, for the bond breaking process, uh, there is a, a degree of ballistic dynamics there. And uh, we know that this one is more directly connected to the rate. And we would probably prefer in those cases to optimize according to this criteria. So the question is, is optimizing this systematically causing problems in, in the behavior of the transmission coefficient? And we can go back to Pollock's model itself. This is this uh, bilinear coupled oscillators model. Um, we saw this in the transition state theory lecture because it just does reduce down to transition state theory. You diagonalize this uh, Hessian matrix. Uh, there's one negative eigenvalue. Uh, the reaction coordinate becomes the displacement from the saddle point in uh, the mass weighted coordinates. And what we're hoping is in the real system, this will happen. In this problem, we know that it will happen, right? We know that with a Hamiltonian like this, it is possible with this coordinate to get kappa equals 1 and the committer probability distribution infinitely sharp, okay? So no width of the committer distribution. You've, you've actually got perfection in your reaction coordinate accuracy. And kappa equals 1 uh, also means perfection in your reaction coordinate. They are perfectly consistent with each other for this model, right? So that's why we chose this, to see what happens when we run likelihood maximization on this little problem, OK? So here is, uh, uh, you know, one coordinates generated for different as though I had done likelihood maximization 2,000 times, it's a statistic. So every time it will give you a different result. And we wanted to see what are the properties of that statistic. So we computed for every one of these 2,000 reaction coordinates, we computed kappa and the committer distribution. And we just measured the width of the committer distribution for each of those cases. And here's the, here's the result. Um, you know, what you want is to be up here in this corner, right? And you see that likelihood maximization is Sometimes, getting up here to high values of kappa, it's always giving you a pretty narrow committer distribution. They, you know, 0.1 is really good on the standard distribution. Uh, but, but sometimes it is indeed possible that you move to the left in this diagram and simultaneously move down. Okay? So, why am I telling you all this? Because this inspired us to, uh, to do something different. Right? So we developed this inertial maximization framework. I'm not going to call this thing PB because it's, it includes velocity information. Uh, so it is a, uh, in the general sense, uh, a predictor of the outcome of a trajectory along a trial coordinate QT uh, with velocity along that trial coordinate QT dot uh, that tells you if this is my initial position along QT, initial velocity along QT, uh, what is the probability that I will end up on the far side after a long time? Uh, so we can use that just the same way that we did likelihood maximization with configuration-only information before we only had this term. We did not have this guy in here. Okay? So now we optimize this likelihood, and you see that this is really, I think, the first time this has ever been demonstrated, that we have a systematic algorithm that's actually practical, unlike VTST, uh, for finding, rea finding reaction coordinates with high transmission coefficients. Right? So this... This allows us to automatically go and discover what is, so this is this inertial likelihood maximization. Here's the results from the original likelihood maximization. And you see that we're always getting very high transmission coefficients uh, when we use this way of doing things. Now, the nice thing about this way of 
of running likelihood maximization, including the trial velocity information, is that, uh, of course, if you're re working with an inertial process, you get a high transmission coefficient, and that's what you want. But also, if you're in the diffusive regime, likelihood maximization recognizes that A is entirely unimportant in all cases. It doesn't matter what coordinate you pick, it always tells you that because there, there's just a, you know, very high friction on all coordinates, it'll tell you that A should be zero, and it reverts back to the original likelihood maximization scheme and automatically optimizes your committer probability. Okay? So, so this now is a, is a numerical method, but a very efficient one. That, that gives you the, the proper answer for what your reaction coordinate should be, all the way from uh, Wigner's theory and variational transition state theory that was so hard to do, uh, all the way to uh, the sort of uh, finding the right uh, variable according to the committer, uh, the sort of transition path theory kind of framework uh, that you'll hear about next week. So I'll have a way of discovering what that coordinate should be. Okay, and now we can go back and use this for likelihood, max, likelihood maximization and the sodium chloride problem. So now we're using the inertial framework. And you see that now a different guy pops up. It tells you uh, that uh, the interionic density is important. So counting the number of waters that have moved into that region between the two ions. And uh, the result now is that kappa indeed increases, as Pollock would have suggested. Uh, and so the one thing that we don't know is you know, there's still some width in this histogram, quite a bit, really. So if we could find the exact reaction coordinate, would it go all the way to 1? We can directly do that. This is not a committer distribution. This is the free energy as a function of the committer probability. And that's a strange object, a very expensive object to compute, it turns out. Uh, and we can also compute the transmission coefficient directly using the committer probability as our reaction coordinate, right? So uh, what you see is that even if you could perfectly optimize the reaction coordinate in terms of some physically meaningful variable that would give you an exact prescription for what the committer probability is, you would still not reach kappa equals 1. Okay? So, uh, it's beautiful not to take anything away from it, but I think that this harmonic description uh, is, is not uh, descriptive of what happens in a real solvent environment. And, uh, and so I, I think that's, uh, that's kind of exciting that we, that we know this now. And we know that you know, we have a way of finding the a coordinate that will really saturate uh, this transmission coefficient for inertial dynamics.